glasses are falling. Is the heat on in here? <laughs> huh? It's 70 degrees, girl. Joanne's hot, too. <laughs> Paint that dress hot. I love it. My glasses are this far. I'm just right. And it's soaking wet. Well, <clears throat> I can't lie to you. I'd like to make up a real good excuse, but I, I didn't forget. I, I, just, I just didn't get to it to give you all some lessons in your hands about tonight's lesson. So I did like I did last week. I put all of it on the board. Amen. Uh, so the lesson is about how spiritual vagabonds are born. Uh, one of the definitions of a vagabond, it says one having no settled home who wanders from place to place. Now remember, this, this week is following up uh, <clears throat> about fathers that are disobedient and the damage is caused by that. And this week it kind of takes on a, a real personal thing for pastors and leaders of the church. So uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, uh, Eli was a priest and he had two sons named, named Phinehas and, and uh, Hophni, I think, H-O-P-H-N-I. And he was the priest. Verse 22 said, Now Eli was very old, and he heard that his sons uh, <clears throat> did to Israel, and heard what his sons did to Israel, how that they lay down with the women assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He said to them, he said to his sons, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. And so this, this local, this local, group, this local congregation, the sons of the priest himself were having sexual relations with the women that were hanging out at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They knew why they were hanging out there. You can assure that Satan had them hang out there. Amen. And then also his, his sons, which he, he, they, their, their dad was the priest, they were having uh, physical relations with them. And, uh, and so Eli did what needed to be done. He confronted them with what they were doing. Uh, and just keep in mind about the vagabonds as we go through this. And so I wrote the question here, how did Samuel handle this situation involving the priest Eli's sons? And I put there, did he leave that congregation? And so 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, if you'll turn there, you can see, you can see what Eli did. Eli did not leave that congregation. Eli ministered unto the Lord according to 1 Samuel 3.1. The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord. Now this is, this is real catchy right here because this is kind of what we're dealing with today and it's disobedience to the word of God. The word of the Lord was precious. When you look up the word precious in the Hebrew there, it means the word of God was rarely given. They were, they were, I mean, it was a rare thing to, to, to go and hear the word of God. It, it was being hidden. It was being squashed out by all the bad things that were happening. And it said in those days, and it said there was no open vision. So if, if you don't have the word of God, just like with us, I mean, met, uh, we talked about some, some stuff that really made us angry today when I read the letter and met with those folks at h &R ministry, but I haven't lost my hope in Christ. Amen. 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 I haven't lost my hope in what, what God does through individuals and, and you in this congregation the way that you all work and the way that you serve and you give and you love i haven't lost anything in that and so we have to remember that as long as we've got the word of god and, and it's given it's not rarely given uh here in a lot of churches still in west kentucky the word of god's still being preached Amen. and shared right. and so people do have a vision and but and then and so <clears throat> this goes along with the statement that was made to me the other day and this came from a fellow riding in my vehicle and I wrote it down. Some of you probably can't read it that far away. But it said, Brother Mike, the last two pastors I've had, both have had affairs with members of our congregation. So my last two pastors. And we began to discuss what needed to happen. And so <clears throat> look, at, look at your Bibles now, James chapter 1, and we're going to see how all this stuff starts. James chapter 1 tells us where all these things begin. Verse 12. It said, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. 
For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, then neither tempts he with any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, in other words, like Bathsheba, that lust eventually became conceived with a child. Amen? When lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And then he gives us a warning. Do not err, my beloved brethren. If you ever want to know exactly what the Bible says about something and you get confused, go to the book of James. Because he doesn't miss any words. He's real easy to understand. And uh, he, it's one of my, probably my favorite book uh, outside of the Gospels uh, that we can read. And so all these, all these things came about because of lust. Every, everyone, everything became because of lust. These, these women that, that, that hung out at the tabernacle, right at the door of going into the church, they hung out. They knew what they were doing. That was because of lust. And then Eli, and, and, or not Eli, but, but uh, Phineas and Hophni, they took advantage of lust and acted on it. And so that, that's why that this priest had to confront his sons, and it didn't just affect them. So you see here, Eli says, I hear of all your evil dealings by all this people. And so the people had began to talk, and that's how Eli found out about what was going on in his own congregation. So <laughs> this is all related to spiritual vagabonds. And if you look at the artwork over there that... that uh, uh, Wes Cole did. He shows a a uh, a guy with a a little thing with, with a bandana full of everything he owned in it, and he's leaving he's leaving the church. And I really don't know why he always does everybody bald headed. Anybody ever notice that? <laughs> huh? <laughs> well, he does. He does a lot bald headed. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to get into some things that aren't real comfortable to talk about, but we need we need to talk about. Them. And so, when, when things like that, what my friend told me about, should he be the one to leave that church and find the perfect pastor and the perfect congregation? There's no such thing. There's no Why not? There's no perfect pastor and there's no perfect congregation. Amen. Right. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever look at me that I'm better than you. Don't you ever do that. Don't ever do that. I'm, I'm just like y'all. I'm just called to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen? If you looked up to me very far, then uh, you're going to be looking down or something. Amen? So, <clears throat> a spiritual vagabond could be somebody that's just bouncing, going from church to church, and, and I call them a cafeteria Christian. Uh, that's going to the church, all the different churches, and you know how you do when you go to a cafeteria or like a buffet? You start picking over these certain things that you gotta have. You know, I I go to the meat first. Don't y'all see anybody else go to the meat? I see what the meat is. And I stay away from anything green and pretty. Uh, I go to the meat and look for the baked beans and, and uh, anything in the bread. Amen. So that's what he's trying to say in, in this lesson that we're starting to dig into a little bit. Is that really God has placed you there. We shouldn't be the ones to leave. You shouldn't be the ones to leave if this pastor does something stupid like that. Amen. He needs to be the one to leave. Right. Am I right? right? It needs to be him. But it doesn't take it doesn't take much for us, especially if nobody does anything about it. It doesn't take long before folks want to leave, don't they? Because you're sitting there thinking, man, I feel helpless. This guy here is still doing wrong. And uh, which I'm not trying to keep score, but by the way, one of these one of these two is still pastor. One of those two still pastor. That's sad. Amen? Amen. So, 1 Corinthians 12, 18. The question comes for you is that but now, now God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it's pleased Him. You may not realize it or not, but you're here because it pleases God. So how, how, how did some of you even find Benzoil? I mean, I'll, I'll be here six years in August, but I don't have a clue where some of y'all come from. Amen? So how, so how did you find this? Or what convinced you that this is where you belong? Because it says God is the one that set you here. So what, what is it that drew you here? Somebody, 
Somebody husband. speak up. Maybe I'll be dry by the time we get done. My husband, my family's in here. Your family? Yeah. My family was here when we came. Anybody the else? Loving people. The loving people. The loving people. Would you have stayed? Would you have stayed if you had one of these pastors? Pardon? Can you ask that pastor to leave if something like that comes? Do you do that one person at a time, or how do you do that in Matthew 18? If you look there, if there's an alt between a congregation or yourself and somebody like that's done wrong, you go with them. It doesn't just say one; it says even two or three. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Matthew 18 gives you gives you a way to go to that pastor and say, "Look, here's here's what's happened, and we're asking you that you need to sit down uh, as a pastor." Right? And if he disagrees with you, then what's the next move in Matthew 18? You, you bring it before the church, correct? Mm -hmm. I know these aren't fun things to talk about. Amen? But you, you need to know what to do, right? right. So, so everybody, everybody that's here tonight, you're, you're convinced this is where God puts you. Right? Yeah. No doubt. You have no doubt that this is where you belong. So, <clears throat> let's look at this. Because really all these lessons are about being offended. Remember that if you're in the place God wants you, the devil will try to offend you to get you out. Right? Yeah. He wants to uproot men and women from the place where God placed them. If he can get you out, he's been successful. If you will not budge, even in the midst of great conflict, you will spoil his plans. Now Psalm 92, 13, I cheated and wrote that down for you all. Is those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Uh, now look at Psalm chapter 1. Let's go to Psalm chapter 1. Somebody, I'm tired of hearing my voice. Somebody read verses 1 through 6, please. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So... <clears throat> Is that, in, is that in a roundabout way saying, stay, stay where you're planted? And God's going to bless you? Is that what it's saying? Sounds like Do you have a reason? What if you have, what if you have a good, good, good reason to leave? Should you leave? Sometimes the Lord might be sending you to help some other congregation in some way. I mean, what if you're a pastor that nothing bad is going on and God says you belong somewhere else? You do what the Lord says. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So sometimes there are reasons to leave our church home, but we we we've got to be we've got to be led by the Lord. So the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He He leads us in the right way, and, and so as. Uh, Shannon made that point out, said, you know, you're not going to find a perfect pastor. You're not going to find a perfect congregation. You know, uh, when, when you go to some of these places and they insist on uh, interviewing you for a long time and such, and, and uh, you know, you don't ever, you don't ever as a pastor, or I didn't, maybe I'm just not very smart. I don't, you, you don't ask them what's going on. You don't ask them why they're looking for a pastor, or I, I've never had. You'd realize that you're either supposed to go there or you're not. 
and uh, something's happened so that there's an opening, but if you're not careful, you're going to be digging into a past that you don't know all the facts, and you need to find out if that's where God's sending you, you're, you're not going to go to a perfect congregation, and then they're not going to get a perfect pastor. Amen? Right. And so you just have to make up your mind if you're going to be obedient, because you, you're not ever going to step into a perfect situation. If you do, there'll be no people there. Yeah. Amen? Amen? There will be no people there. So you have, you have to chew on that in a, just in the right way and just realize, you know, just like if you read in the scripture about, you remember Philip? He was preaching and people were being saved and ministry was going good and God said, I'm going to send you to a desert. And he meets up with who? The Ethiopian eunuch. And if he didn't send him there to do anything else, was to see that man saved. Amen? Amen. And so that's the way we have to look at it. And so I've never done any of this. My, my wife is, is uh, pretty slick with planting stuff, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> with the Lord's help. <laughs> so what happens to a plant when you transplant it? How many of y'all transplanted plants? What happens, if, what happens if you just keep transplanting that same one? Huh? It's going to wilt. It's going to wilt and die. And so what's going to happen to your spiritual life? If you are that cafeteria Christian, and you just keep moving on and on and on and on. You'll be somewhere two or three years and something doesn't suit you. You move somewhere else. You move somewhere else. Does that build up your faith and make you stronger? Or are you going to do like Judy said? If you don't get rooted, and that's what a transplant has to get rooted. And that's yeah. Jimmy, just, Jimmy just stole the scripture away from us. There, <laughs> Mark, Mark chapter 4. Look at that in your Bible. Jimmy's not bashful. He wouldn't mind reading that for us, would you, buddy? Mark chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Mark, Mark chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Mark 4. What are the verses? 14 And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. And have fire. No, no. Y'all are all close. The sower sold the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately received it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure. But for a time, afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the world's sake, immediately they are offended, and these are they which are sown amongst the thorns, such as, as heard the word. So, <clears throat> at the end of verse 17 tells you what offends them. What is it that offends them? For what sake? Why in the world would somebody be offended by the word? Because what? How many times have they been transplanted? How many times have they been moved? How many times have they changed churches? Amen? Yeah. They have no root in themselves. And so therefore yeah. they're, they're, they're on that shallow ground. So that they're, not, they're, they're, <clears throat> they're not rooted deep. Uh, and, and it comes up, the question comes up to me a lot from other pastors, not from me. They don't ask me much. Because they don't need to. But we discussed these things that, that there's a whole... There's a whole generation that go back, what is it, 30 years? I think when the Ten Commandments were taken out of the schools. There's a whole generation of, of kids that we're dealing with, and some of y'all are in this congregation that, that probably didn't have the Ten Commandments on the wall in your school. They're gone. They're gone out of school. And uh, I heard Brother Harold share today that he watched his, watched his teacher go down the hall with tears running down his face having to take the Ten Commandments down out of school, you know. Can we not see the difference between now and go back those years to where it was torn off the wall? Amen. Can we not see the difference? <clears throat> was there a school shooting every other day back then? No. Was, um, was there all these things? The first, what is the first one? Thou shalt not what? Yeah. Yeah. Got a whole generation. And now we've applied on top of that generation that they're not reading that thou shalt not kill. And so... <clears throat> So if you've discovered that your pastor or leader was corrupt or wicked, so I wrote here just right out of the question and answer book, so what, what should be your response? Get angry? 
Can you get angry about it and sin not? The Bible says to be angry with sin not. Can you get angry without sinning? Jesus did, didn't he? Yeah, he turned those, he turned those tables over because they were using the house of God for a place to buy and sell. Should you judge the offender? Should you judge the offender? No. Lord's a judge. Okay. Can you do this? Speak the truth in love. Amen. What if he doesn't receive it in love? Shake the dust off your feet. Huh? Shake the dust off your feet and go on. Okay. Confront the offender face to face. There's nothing wrong with that, is it? You're supposed to by yourself. Well, with you. yeah, it, it says either one or two or three. Uh, my advice is always to take more than you with you, when you especially when you're confronting the th kind of thing we're talking about. Rebuke the offender. This is the one that we normally do. And I don't know if anybody's ever faced this. Don't we normally complain to others about what's going on before, before we speak the truth in love or confront the offender face to face do we not normally do that first yeah. that mean we do things kind of backwards yeah so what what happens is just like just like with this situation right here if you remember over here eli heard of what was going on in his congregation from the people before he ever knew about what was happening with his own sons. You know what I mean? So in other words, there was a, there was a rumor mill going around. It didn't, it didn't mean that it wasn't true, but he needed to hear it from somebody that comes and says, you know, here's what's going on with your sons. Uh, you need to deal with this, but it, it, it normally doesn't happen that way. Normally we complain to others first. And what, what if we did this first? What if we prayed first? So, What's, what, what's the proper order here? here here's your test for now. What's the proper order here? Do you pray first? Speak the truth in love first? Confront the offender face to face? Pray first. Pray first? And then what, what do you think would be next? Speak the truth in love. Yep. Y'all made an A, I think. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Why is it that we get in the middle of these things? Why is it that we, we look up and we're thinking, my goodness, how did this happen? How did this turn overnight from what we've had worshiping the Lord and God saving people, changing people, and the church is growing and all that, then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a deal like that? It's, it's either going to make us stronger or weaker. Amen? Amen. Now, we can have confrontation within the body of Christ without it being, you're ready to throw me out. Amen? <coughs> because sometimes the people on this side of the church don't really like the people over there. I've seen the way y'all look at them tonight. <laughs> Amen? And sometimes the people over here don't like to sit with these people. Amen? Have you ever just got up on a Sunday and go sit totally by somebody that you don't ever sit by? Don't you feel kind of weird? <laughs> Amen? Because that's your seat. <laughs> Amen? That's your seat. That's your church. Your seat. Amen? But if we have people here that are sitting in our seat, I think everybody here is good. They can just go find another seat. Yeah, y'all do. I've been proud of y'all because when that bunch from Lifeline came last time, there were 60 of them. I mean, I like to go around and make comments to you but, about you being uprooted, but it doesn't seem like it bothers you all. And that makes a big difference to them. I even said up front. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and you've been back there ever since. <laughs> but believe it or not, you wouldn't believe how many of those men spoke to me that day about that. Said your people let us sit everywhere. And that means a lot to this pastor. That tells me who you all are. You know, it touches my heart. So, he allows things in our life and in the ministry and even in the church to shape us by a refining fire. Uh, you know, we would like to be refined by something different than fire, wouldn't we? Amen? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you like to be refined by something a whole lot more comfortable? 
and a whole lot more easy, but life does not work that way, and neither does ministry. So 1 Peter 1, 6, 7 says, We're in you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. But look what he puts right there. Anybody notice that? If need be, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So there, there is a time that the Lord allows you to be tempted. To do what with you? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes. Though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, these, these seasons that he allows in your life is to grow you and to grow me. Amen. 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 Wouldn't you like to grow a different way? <laughs> Amen. But we don't, do we? Amen. How old was Aaron when he started going through his growth pains in his legs when he was playing basketball? Probably about seventh or eighth grade, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He, he just had the awfulest time. Uh, just a normal athletic kid, very athletic, but just the awfulest pains as his body began to change, and it gave him a whole lot of pain, and, and uh, it, it was a, it was hard to watch him go through that, and it, it almost made him look appear to be flat-footed as he ran. There was so much pain, uh, pain as he played uh, sports, uh, but <clears throat> and it's more precious than of gold that, that perishes. And uh, so though it be tried by fire, it might be found a praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the, these things that have happened, that whether it's inside the church or inside of your family, inside of the, the ministry where you work or the job that you work, these things that God allows in your life, even these very painful things, God's done it to see what you're made of. That's the refining of gold in the fire. So they put fire to the gold so that the, what happens to the impurities? That's right. It boils them out. Amen? It boils them right out. And, and so that it's done to grow us. It's done to refine us. It's done to make us more like him. Brother Yes. You know, the statement you made there, the Lord, you know, I think he knows what the answer's going to be. But sometimes we don't know we're, we're there. We don't really know ourselves. You know, yeah. We get put in that situation. Hopefully, yeah. you know, yeah. every time and the stakes, we learn from them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, since God's been everywhere and knows everything about us, just like, I think, was it last week or week before, we, we discussed the fact that just like with Adam, when uh, when God cried out to him, well, where are you, Adam? Did God not know where Adam was? Did God not know that Adam had uh, already, already taken the life of the first animal and covered her body? Don't you think God knew where he was at? Yeah. Absolutely. Don't you think he does say that... that Sometimes with us, he already knows how we're going to respond, but we need to see where we're at in our standing with him. That's why he did that with Adam. He had his chance right then to say, God, I'm so sorry. What did he do? He blamed his wife. Amen? Blamed his wife. But this woman you gave me, amen? How many husbands have done that? It don't pay off. It don't pay off? <laughs> Uh, her expression is priceless right now. <laughs> so, here's our test. Do I run from God's refining pressure? Do I run from it? No. Or do you hang in there like a hair in a biscuit? Huh? We just about feel like we have to try it on our own, don't we? What was it that God says in his word? His ways are not our ways, and his words are what than our ways? Higher, Higher than our ways, yes, ma'am. So, do I run from refining pressure? Do I complain when under pressure? Most likely. Everybody said, well, no, Stephen's grinning now. He's, he's guilty too. 
Hit my cameraman grinning. <laughs> Thirdly, do I justify my sin and condemn the sin of others? Yeah. Have we ever thought somebody else's sin was just so... Well, one of the commentaries I read about some of these things said, said our, our stupid looks so different than other people's stupid, mm -hmm. was the way this writer put it. When we say, that's the stupidest thing you... You're so stupid. And then do we do anything stupid? Yeah. Same thing. That right there would change, that would change a church body forever if we wouldn't justify our sin anymore and condemn others. Do I expect spiritual leaders to be perfect when I'm not? No. No? That's healthy. That's healthy. Does that mean we're, that a pastor I'm supposed to just get away with anything? No. 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 I've already learned that about you all. I don't have to wonder what you're thinking. You've already told me. <laughs> Amen. Brother Mike, and I appreciate that. In James, it says, um, James 3, 1, it says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Yeah. So, yeah. According to Scripture, I'm, I'm under a stricter judgment, and I should be. Amen. Amen. Well, that's just like what you brought up there about what it says about a man and a wife, and, and, and that's about nature itself. I mean, that is absolutely, you know, going against the foundation of the Scripture. But we see it all the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, pastors and this, that, and yonder, so-called, I don't think it could be to go against, against the Word of God. Against, yeah. yeah. And it's just like this how I said, then you're all helped. Yeah. And even like myself, I mean, if I did the same thing, I hopefully pray it's by accident, and they, yeah, by trying to mislead him, by no way. All right, where we at? Am I willing to listen to God and wait on his leading to stay or leave? Am I willing to listen to God and wait on his leading whether I stay or I leave? Or have we already made up our mind most of the time Right off the bat. We should, but a lot of times we don't. So are, are we are we quicker tempered than, than Christ? Yes. He's very long suffering, isn't he? Yes. Amen. Yeah. So how many of you here are really, really patient people? Oh Lord. Oh y'all. <laughs> <laughs> no, she is, she is patient. Well, I mean, she's long suffering. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I would not be here if it wasn't for her long suffering and her prayer. Amen. That's a God's truth. Yep. God gave me who I was supposed to be married to. Amen. And He knew I'd be He knew I'd be teaching here tonight. I didn't. Amen. Right. He knew He knew that even though she got mad at her mom. I said, I'm going to run off and marry a Baptist preacher. <clears throat> Amen. He knew that I actually would be married to her someday because he had a plan Amen. that I knew nothing about. <clears throat> Amen. Yep. So, let's follow up. So, if you have made up your mind to leave, if God has convinced you that you're supposed to leave, even if this pastor has done wrong, this example has done wrong, if he's convinced you to leave how are you supposed to leave Isaiah 55, 12 and 13 will tell you how to do that Isaiah 55, 12 and 13 and my Bible's upside down hmm. somebody read that one for us Isaiah 55, 12 and 13 for you shall not for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be. So if, if we leave in peace, God honors that. Amen. And he blesses that by new growth and something 
pretty instead of something painful, which is the thorn that's in everybody's side as you go through these things. Yeah, I love the way that's because you go out with peace, God blesses it. Instead of the thorn comes up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. It shall be the Lord for a name. So, in other words, at, at the end of this thing, uh, if everybody leaves in the same manner of anger and confrontation and all those kind of things, well, where, where in the world does that leave? They leave that congregation in an absolute worse mess than when you came. Amen? Mm -hmm. Because you went out the door unpeaceful. So, these are all challenges to us in the Word of God. That doesn't mean that we always do them, but these are, these are things that the Word of God is telling us that we need to do so that we don't become that vagabond that goes from place to place and doesn't have a, a home or that you're settled or that you can grow and produce fruit. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Anybody got anything else tonight about tonight's? Anybody? <coughs> anybody here has ever, anybody here ever been felt forced, felt forced that you needed to leave, that you had to leave. Good. Remember that? Yes. We had it about 15 years ago. I mean, it's positive, I'm going to say, but the piano player here, uh, Miss Lois Short, and they was here every time the doors was open, or Paul was digging, and she went out and said, I'm going to talk to you. And she was telling me that, I mean, they, they was driving from bed and couldn't see, right? And, you know, they were all over. And said, we're going to, and you all know, understood it. They really didn't want to leave, but you know, health-wise, and really, you know, I love them. And but you know, good. And they started where they was. But you know, I mean, talking about leaving on, you know, terms, you know, age. They didn't quit on the Lord. They just went to church, bed where they lived. Right. Some people just quit at a certain age. Yeah. And you know what? I have to remind myself. I hope I don't fall into that. You don't ever know when you say I ain't gonna do this, do that. Sometimes. The Lord used me long to draw bread. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else got anything about tonight? All right. If you're watching via Facebook or YouTube, if you don't know Christ, you need to be born, born again. You need to be saved. Amen. Thank you all for participating. And these aren't always fun things to talk about, but I believe we need to air them out. Amen. Amen. We need to air them out. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, and I'm thankful you brought all this out. I mean, you know, about the church and, and that. Uh, Wes is my nephew and he does a great job I'm drawing that and everybody needs to friend look at you if you have the church in the background but there's a lot but I know when you do it people here we know we got 200 members residential members on the road that's done that right there think about it there wasn't no church in the road I invited a couple this week that had been in the door since they left here 25 years ago yeah. and Satan is, is there any of you know what I'm saying I mean, good people. I'm, I mean, you know, the Satan just hates. That's what I tell people. Satan hates a Christian. Yeah. He hates yeah. you if you're trying yeah. even attempt to do it. He hates this coming together. He hates this church right here. Let me tell you, he'll do anything to destroy it. He'll do any. He'll use me to destroy it. If that was, he'll use you. I mean, yeah. I mean, we have to be honest. He hates anyone in the days we're living in. A lot of people don't ain't worried about all church and Satan. No, it ain't. <coughs> We, we're surrounded by absolute evil right. that wants us destroyed. Wants our testimony destroyed. Wants our church to die. Wants our children <coughs> to be killed. Wants our grandchildren to be killed. Our families, our friends. Yeah, this this thing is black and white as it could possibly be. And I didn't use the word black for the wrong reason. It's not a racial thing. It's right. just, it's an absolutely darkness versus light. Amen. 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 Right. Anyone else got a comment before we? Y'all enjoying this study okay, or does it feel like they're hammering over the same thing every week? We're trying not to. Really enjoy it. You wouldn't tell me if you didn't like it, would you? Yes, some of you would. All right. <laughs> All right. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this night. God, I thank you for the people that Alice and I have been called to. God, that again, uh, they show so much grace. And we love them. Uh, God, we do love them dearly. And uh, Father, we just thank you for them. Uh, God, I thank you for their honesty. God, I thank you for uh, God that they're not afraid to confront the truth, right. and I thank you for that, God. We we need to be a, a, a people. We need to be a church that's known that God. When folks step in here, we're going to hear what the Word of God says. Yeah. We're not going to water it down. We're not going to shorten it, and we're not going to be quiet about it. So God, help us to be bold. And uh, I don't know what's going to come.
come in the, in the next days, but you do. Yeah. Uh, Father, we have a darkness out there. We have uh, an evil that wants the same thing to happen in this congregation and happen to those small children. It would suit Satan no happier than to walk, send somebody here to hurt us. Yeah. Help us to be on our guard. That uh, Father, we have to realize that Jesus said that if the world hates you, it hated me first. Right. So, Father, we love you and thank you for this night. And if somebody's watching, they've never accepted you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you minister to them through your Holy Spirit. Draw them to yourself. And they would ask you right there where they're watching this program, God, that they would ask you into their heart to save them. And you said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. We ask it all in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.